Welcome back everyone, this will be my full Marvel Moon Knight episode 1 video. There's a whole bunch of easter eggs to break down, so if you're brand new to the channel, I will be doing videos for all the episodes just like I do for all the other Disney Plus series. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your favorite easter egg from the episode on the video. So careful for spoilers from the episode if you have not seen Moon Knight episode 1. I'll start at the beginning of the episode and we'll talk about easter eggs, WTF moments from everything as we go along, starting with the episode title. The episode was titled The Goldfish Problem, which is a reference to his changing pet goldfish, Gus, and Stephen Grant learning about the secret existence of Mark Spector. Like, wait a minute, I'm not the real persona? Like, he's slowly learning about what's actually going on. The whole idea in the comics is that Moon Knight developed these alternate personalities when he became Moon Knight, like he died, literally, and then was brought back to life by Khonshu to become his avatar on Earth. He developed alternate personalities that would help him infiltrate other aspects of people's lives and get more information that Mark Spector wouldn't be able to otherwise. So Mark Spector is the original personality, he's the mercenary in the MCU series, in the comics, there wind up being at least five different personalities, but on the TV show, it looks like they're just doing two different ones. There's Stephen Grant, who's presented as this sort of bumbling idiot shop owner who is an expert in Egyptian mythology. And on the other side of things, there's Mark Spector, who's a mercenary with all these skills and is also the Moon Knight persona. So when he's in Moon Knight persona in the costume, he's in full Mark Spector personality. There's also the Mr. Knight persona, which in the comics is different, but the TV show, it seems like it's just going to be another aspect of the Mark Spector personality. Like, he'll still be Mark Spector when he's Mr. Knight. The actual opening scene of the episode is a cold open of Ethan Hawke's villain character, Dr. Arthur Harrow, who is a deep cut from the comics, even though they've changed a lot of his backstory. You see all the objects, they're important to his character, he drinks a glass of water, then shatters the glass and pours it in his shoes just to be that hardcore. I think it's another sly wink at the comics, too. In the comics, his character's born with this genetic condition that causes him to constantly feel pain and he becomes obsessed with it and starts experimenting on people. The character was also a Nazi, but he's a relatively minor character, so this whole God-driven plot with Amit is something new that they've given him from the comics. The tattoo that shifts, his metal bands around his wrist, the crocodile head walking cane are all meant to be references to the goddess Amit, who is a real character in Egyptian mythology. She's referred to as the Eater of the Dead, the judgment of the scales that they talk about, like the scales that shift on his arm, that's actual god power in the MCU. But in Egyptian mythology, when someone died, the god of the afterlife, Anubis, would weigh their mortal soul on a balanced scale against the feather of Maat, the goddess of order. The people that passed the test and were deemed virtuous in life would be lighter than a feather, quote unquote. They would be allowed passage into the Egyptian underworld, the realm of Duat, while the rest of them would be devoured by the goddess Amit. If you couldn't tell, she does have the head of a crocodile. That's not an alligator because alligators weren't native to ancient Egypt. But she's also meant to have the hindquarters of a lion, the world's original boogeyman. The way the MCU series portrays someone failing her test of worthiness is her consuming their soul. So like the woman turns gray because her soul's being eaten, like she literally just dies right in front of them. The title sequence with the MCU logo is just the standard Marvel Phase 4 logo that we get for all the movies and TV shows. Maybe they'll have a custom one later in the series, but this is the same one that you see on most of the series. Every once in a while they do get a custom one though. The song that they play underneath it is just a 60s pop song and it's meant to be a representation of what's happening in Stephen Grant's life as he's waking up in the morning one day. If it wasn't clear, the series is meant to pick up after he's already become Moon Knight, like we see him transform into Moon Knight during the episode. We'll get bits and pieces of his backstory becoming Moon Knight, how that all happened and what went down in later flashbacks. There are a couple references to it during the episode, like he's been missing, quote unquote, for two months. Layla wonders where he's been. That's a reference to when he became Moon Knight for the first time. For the most part, the series will take place between London and in the flashbacks, ancient Egypt. Those will probably go back to Egypt when they try to travel back to the realm of the gods. The pantheon of Egyptian gods that Khonshu belongs to are all basically trapped in a pocket dimension, so they're not inside the normal MCU, but he keeps hearing Khonshu's voice in his head. He keeps seeing him, but it's all happening in his head. Khonshu cannot physically manifest in the world where everybody else could see him. But there are a couple references to that too through Dr. Arthur Harrow's character about his grand mission, like what his whole plan is during the series. If that were to happen, all the Egyptian gods were to come into our world physically, they would be way more powerful. And just to be clear, they're not really advanced aliens pretending to be gods, they are legit gods in the MCU. Little G gods, not like the capital G one true god. 
I just did a video a little while ago about the difference between gods and really powerful cosmic characters. Like the Celestials from the Eternals movie are one of the most powerful groups of cosmic characters. Most of the other lesser little G gods are not powerful enough to challenge the Celestials. So you can actually be a cosmic character and not be a god, but still be more powerful than the gods. Most gods' power comes from the faith of their followers, so if more people start worshiping a god, they become more powerful. That's why in present day, Khonshu does have a lot of power, but most people don't care or know about Khonshu, only Mark Spector and a couple other people, so even though he is powerful, he's way less powerful than he used to be when people did worship him. But the opening scene of Oscar Isaac is of him waking up as Stephen Grant, not understanding anything about Mark Spector or Moon Knight or what's happened. You learn about all these weird things happening around the house, like he's chained to his bed, he's got a circle of sand around the bed, he's got the door taped to see if anybody's come or gone. Based on the way they reveal the Mark Spector personality later in the episode, and his complicity in all this, it sounds like Mark Spector has tried to engineer things to make Steven forget about who Mark Spector is so that he doesn't realize what's going on. Part of his arc during the series will probably be reconciling both of his personalities and understanding that he needs both Stephen Grant and the Mark Spector personality, like they'll start working together more. Hopefully when they show his origin story, they'll also explain who the Stephen Grant persona is and how the series justifies it. Like if Layla didn't know that he existed and he's something relatively recent, why did he slip into the Stephen Grant persona in the first place? We see his goldfish for the first time, which is a reference to the title. He's named Gus. He's got the one fin. They make a bunch of Nemo references too. There are a lot of pop culture references during the series. It winds up being one of the catalysts for him learning what's going on when he learns that he's got a different goldfish than he had before. Like, wait a minute, why does it have two fins now? Everyone has been criticizing the weird British accent that he has. They even call it on the episode too. The Layla character, when he picks up her phone call, asks him straight out, what is up with that weird accent? You can kind of see from all the weird things that are happening in his life as Stephen Grant, he's meant to feel like as different a person and a personality as his Mark Spector personality as possible. Within the context of the MCU, Stephen Grant is a shop owner at this British Museum of History. Obviously, this is taking place in the England area. He understands things about Egyptian history, like he gives that small tour to the little girl. He talks about their culture, their customs. He has reverence for some of their artifacts, like the pyramids. He talks about what happened to people when they died and were mummified, what happened when their life was judged in the field of reeds and how they were allowed or not allowed to enter the afterlife. All things that happen later in this episode and in later episodes just in general. Like that's why the little girl asks him if it sucked for him getting rejected from the field of reeds because it had already happened to him. Like he literally died and then was brought back to life by Khonshu after he formed the bargain with him. The mummies and wraps here on the table foreshadow the actual Moon Knight costume, which are basically like Egyptian mummy wraps that come around him when he activates his powers. All the different stuffed animals represent the Egyptian pantheon of gods, the Ennead that he talks about. He talks about it having nine gods instead of seven, like there's a big air on the poster here and the banners in front of the building. The nine Egyptian gods that he's referencing are Atum, Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Nephithes, and Set. Really cool connection to Thor, Love, and Thunder, Bost, the panther goddess who is worshipped by the panther tribe. The group of people that Black Panther's ancestors come from, who they derive their power from, is also Khonshu's sister in the MCU. In fact, the reason why you see Bost, the panther goddess, in this lineup here is because in the current version of Marvel Comics, she is part of the Ennead. Now, the roster changes a little bit over time, so the MCU version is going to be a little bit different from the comic book version. Khonshu is actually the son of the leader of their pantheon at the moment, Atum, who's also known as Amun-Ra. Like Atum is meant to be the sun god, Khonshu is the Egyptian god of the moon, but in the MCU, Khonshu is also the god of vengeance, which is the main reason why he forms the bargain with Mark Spector to become his avatar. Khonshu finds out what Amit, the other goddess, is planning and he wants to stop her. Then he has that longer funny scene talking to the statue about this weird alternate life, just kind of hinting at the idea of Mark Spector before he's learned about him. The leaf that blows on the water as he's walking away is also meant to be a reference to Egyptian mythology in the goddess Amit and some of the things that were associated with her character. All meant to foreshadow the Arthur Harrow twist later when he starts talking about her. When he goes back home and the recording starts speaking to him, trying to help him stay awake, all these different techniques, they do a montage of him learning more about Egyptian history. He starts reading about this quote unquote hidden god, like the one true god of Egypt at one point. That's a reference to when the pharaoh at the time abolished worship of the old pantheon and told everybody to worship this one god. And it's one of the first examples in the world of monotheism. 
Then when he starts playing with the Rubik's Cube, he throws it up, but when he catches it back down, he actually wakes up in the field after a big time jump. So if it wasn't clear what's happening here, this is all time moving forward and he's just slipping between different personalities like he's gone to sleep and switched into his alternate Mark Spector persona and during all the missing time that we've seen, he's actually gone to Germany to steal the scarab beetle and tried to escape. The reason why he wakes up in the field of grass here in Germany with the people shooting him out the window is because he literally just jumped out the window and hurt his jaw on the fall. But the thing is, is the impact of him hitting the ground caused him to switch back to the Stephen Grant persona, which is why he's still speaking with Stephen Grant's voice. Like, wait a minute, how I get here? What's going on? They kind of play it that way the rest of the episode. There are several time jumps, and each time you always wake up as the Stephen Grant persona after Mark Spector has done something crazy. But we do see Conchu for the first time and hear him speak. It's F. Murray Abraham, Solieri himself. He's been in a billion different things, so you remember him from somewhere. But it'll be a lot of fun to hear him yelling in his ear this whole time, yelling at both of them. Like, if you both fail, he gets the scare beetle back. I'll kill both of you. The whole idea with Conchu is that he is not a good god. He's very capricious, he switches his mood on a dime, and he really only cares about himself, but he does try to do good things. But you have to remember, he doesn't really care about humanity that much. During this series, he's really just trying to prevent Amit from entering the world and killing a whole bunch of people. The whole idea with the Scarab Beetle, as you've seen in the trailer footage, is that it acts as sort of like a god-tier compass, and it sounds like they're going to be using it to help them find the entrance to the realm of the gods. Like Arthur Harrow talks about wanting Amit to exist physically in our MCU dimension, it sounds like the Scarab Beetle is going to help him do that. They have a much longer scene with Ethan Hawke's Arthur Harrow character, who seems a little bit confused about what's going on with Stephen Grant, like, okay, give me the Scarab Beetle back, but he doesn't yet realize that he's not talking to Mark Spector. They show him using Amit's power for the first time. They weigh a couple of different people just to show you what happens to people who are good and people who are evil, people who fail the test. Like I said, if you fail the test, she consumes your soul. She basically just sucks it right out of your body. They're using a very bloodless method to show it on screen. I think what'll happen in the series is that we'll physically see her eventually in CG and we'll see a version of her like actually eating someone. When he identifies Mark Spector as a mercenary, give me the Scarab mercenary. That's just a comic book reference because Mark Spector was a mercenary before he became Moon Knight. When he tries to give him the Scarab, but then closes his fist, that's also meant to be a sly wink at him being called the Fist of Conchu in the comics, but it's also a reference to Conchu controlling his body physically. So remember he died and then agreed to become Conchu's avatar and execute his will on Earth, so Conchu brought him back to life. When that happened, it formed a bond between them. It also gave Conchu control of his body, so Conchu can actually take over his body if he wants to at certain times. After he gets mobbed as Stephen Grant, he passes out again. There's another time jump, switching to Mark Spector, and wakes up as Stephen Grant after having just beat the crap out of a bunch of people. He steals the cupcake truck, which you can see now clearly does not say Von Doom. When the first trailer dropped, there were so many comments about this on my video. Is this Von Doom? Does this mean Doctor Doom is coming to the MCU? Just like I said on that video, just like I'm saying now, no, it is not a Doctor Doom reference, but he will eventually come to the MCU in some other form. They play the George Michael song, Wake Me Up, as Stephen Grant tries to escape, which is meant to be commentary on the action, like Stephen Grant is hoping that he wakes up from this nightmare and also wakes up later in the Stephen Grant persona. I'll talk about that in a second, too. But it's also a reference to Conchu yelling in his ear about going to sleep so that Mark Spector can wake up and take over so that they can accomplish what it is that Conchu wants him to do. There's another small time jump where he wakes up with the gun in his hand. He's taking care of some of the attackers, but not everybody. The truck stops because it runs out of fuel, but then he's barely saved by the falling lumber from higher up on the hill. You also notice during all these different action scenes and the time jumps that the different henchmen all have the scale tattoos on their arms, as do the other people later in the episode. They probably have something to do with Arthur Harrow being able to control them using Ahmed's power. It's sort of like the show's version of a Hail Hydra kind of moment, like we are amongst you everywhere, we've infiltrated all of society and you're only learning about it now. But then he slips back between personalities and when he wakes up again, it's in his bed chained just like he did when he went to sleep and the reason why he starts laughing and crying is because he mistakenly believes that it was all just a bad dream when really a couple days have gone by. Which they use the goldfish, like the title implies, the goldfish problem, when he learns that the goldfish is different. And then he goes to the dinner to have the steak dinner with the woman, but finds out it's a couple days later than it's supposed to be. After he does figure the date out, he starts finding Mark Spector's hidden belongings, the cell phone, the key to the storage locker with all of his weapons and his mercenary gear that we'll see probably in episode two. He sees the missed calls are from Layla, his love interest. She's an archaeologist that we'll meet in episode two as well. She's sort of a combination of the Marlene character with a couple other characters in the comics. 
She says it's been two months since she's learned about what happened to him and she doesn't know who Stephen Grant is. That's why I say that Stephen Grant persona is probably something new that happened after he became Moon Knight for the first time. And it's been about two months since he became Moon Knight. If you're a longtime Moon Knight comic book reader, you also recognize the Duchamp name on his phone. That person is Frenchie from the comics. He's sort of his partner as a mercenary and his pilot. He flies him around, helps him get whatever it is that he needs, whatever weapons. Then when he stares in the mirror and he starts trying to figure everything out, things start shaking, he actually sees a reflection of Mark Spector speaking to him, even though it's kind of dark, you don't really see it till later in the episode when he's in the bathroom. But it's Mark Spector's voice speaking to him, telling him to stop, you're gonna get yourself in trouble. When they have the scene of Conchu coming to him in the elevator like he's physically moving towards him, it's actually just happening in his head, like he tells the old woman, oh, I'm looking for my contact lens on the floor. The old woman is real, she just can't see Conchu because it's happening in his head. There is a bit of a flaming skull easter egg over here in the graffiti. You could call that a Ghost Rider reference because Moon Knight and Ghost Rider are both members of the Midnight Suns team. It sounds like they're using the Moon Knight series in the Werewolf by Night series, the Blade movie, Kit Harrington and the Eternals movie to sort of set up a darker team up in the MCU. So it sounds like eventually we'll see a version of that happen. They have another time jump as he switches between personalities and wakes up as Stephen Grant on the bus the next day. He also sees Conchu again outside, remember it's just happening in his head, but he also sees Arthur Harrow, and Arthur Harrow is really there following him as we learn later. When he confronts him about his Stephen Grant persona, the joke about it being an alias is a comic book reference because that is the way that it started out, it's just that he slowly grew crazy over time, and eventually comic book Moon Knight couldn't tell who the original person was, like who's the real personality and who are the fake ones. When he's confronting Stephen Grant, he's standing next to a depiction of Amit on the pillar next to him while they start talking about her. The reason why Arthur Harrow thinks that he's a good person doing good things is because Amit theoretically only consumes the souls of people who are evildoers, but they're taking it to a full minority report place in the MCU. The whole plan here that he kind of tells him in this episode is that he wants Amit to be able to physically enter our universe so that she'll be able to judge everyone instantly killing everyone who ever will do evil things, and even the Avengers would have a problem with that. Like Thanos is a really good example. Star Fox, the other Eternals, didn't care about Thanos because they didn't really hate him until he killed half the universe. When Arthur Harrow says her own avatar and the other Egyptian gods betrayed her, she's talking about Khonshu and his other pantheon, like they probably found out what she was planning to do and then just tried to trap her in their pocket dimension. He also kind of reveals that he's become the avatar of Amit as well, just like he is the avatar of Khonshu. They make a bunch of pop culture references. They reference Avatar The Last Airbender. I can't remember the last time I heard that reference in a big MCU pop culture show, calling it anime too. Like, ah, remember the classic argument, is Avatar The Last Airbender Western animation actually anime even though it's not produced inside Japan? He references the live action James Cameron Avatar movies, which are actually Disney movies now. Like Fox is making Avatar 2, but Disney bought Fox, so now it's a Disney movie. That's coming out this December. So it's a bit of a slight wink at that too. Like, oh, by the way, Disney is also releasing a giant movie this Christmas. The Avatar movies are back. And when he tries to help him, quote unquote, weighing him with his scales using the power of Amid on him and says there's chaos in him getting all surprised, that's because when he tries to use the power against him, the scales won't stop to give him a yes or no answer. They just keep shifting because technically Mark Spector has died already. The scales are only supposed to judge people who have not died yet. Another great example would be for people like Vision who are artificial people, like the scales would not work on Vision. When he's walking through this room, he actually walks past the statue of Atum, who is Conchu's father in their pantheon, like he has a biological father who's more powerful than he is. He also sees a reflection of Mark Spector staring back at him, which stays stationary while Stephen Grant walks on. Then when he tries to escape the dog, he runs into the bathroom, and in the mirrors of the bathroom, Mark Spector literally confronts him, like, okay, look, Stephen, let me explain what's going on. You're not gonna die, but you gotta help me out. You gotta give me control. We see what it looks like when he slips between personalities, he slips back into the Mark Spector personality, and we see what it looks like when he activates his power and the costume forms around him, proceeding to beat the crap out of the Anubis dog. And then they end the episode with the shot of him walking into camera with the full Moon Knight costume, giving you a good look at it. They play a bunch of Egyptian-inspired theme music over the end credits as they also depict all the Egyptian gods, the relevant artifacts that he uses or going to be using during the series, all the locations that they'll visit or we will see in flashbacks. Like they show London, they show the sands of Egypt, they show the pyramids, they show Moon Knight's costume in great detail, all the mummy-looking cloth wraps. The doors that they also depict here at the end are also probably a representation of entering the pocket dimension that the gods are trapped in. But there's a billion things that we could talk about. I'll try to save some of that stuff for when it shows up in episodes and we'll just address it as we go along, episode by episode. 
My full Moon Knight Episode 2 video will post next week. There are six total, if that wasn't clear. I'll do bonus videos for it in between that, so leave all your requests in the comments if there's something special about Moon Knight you want me to make a video about in the next day or two. Everyone click here to learn why the real gods of the MCU like Khonshu didn't stop Thanos, and click here for my brand new Moon Knight trailer videos. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.